Here we go. Good job, man. Good job. Nice. Nice work, pal. Here you go. Power up. Here you go, man. Onward and upward. Five K local gobble wobble. I'm Michael McKnight. I currently live in Cache Valley, Utah. I'm an endurance coach. I currently coach 18 people who are interested in learning about how to increase their endurance, who are interested in learning how to implement strength training into their plan, and then also people who are interested in learning how to implement a low carb, high fat approach. I'm a low carb endurance athlete, so a lot of people who come to me for coaching are interested in approaching similarly to running the way I do with nutrition. They're interested in figuring out how to be more efficient at burning fat for fuel. The reason I started looking into a low carb approach is because I had a lot of issues with my stomach going south in the middle of a race or I would end up losing energy because I wouldn't eat enough because I didn't want to throw up. And so people who come to me who are interested in this same approach typically have those issues as well and they're just trying to find a way that they can run happy and not have those issues. So the majority of the people that are coming to me for coaching are interested in learning more about that style of eating. After I started to see success in my performance after living a low-carb lifestyle, I decided to look into coaching. And I found that a lot of the people who want to go into longer distances are interested in my coaching services. And the reason being is just because I've seen a lot of success with the longer distances. In 2017, I started to get into the 200 mile distance. I was able to finish the Triple Crown with the fastest combined time. Then in 2019, I went after the Triple Crown again and tried to beat my fastest combined time. And I actually was able to beat it by just over 40 hours. So 
the, the difference between the two years was pretty drastic and I can attribute a lot of that to me following the low carb lifestyle a little bit more strictly. And then with COVID happening, I decided that with my races being canceled, I wanted to go after a zero calorie 100. I've always wanted to see how far I could go relying simply on my fat storage. And with 100 miles being the kind of the big distance that a lot of ultra runners work for, I decided that that was the distance I wanted to see was see if it was possible or not. And I finished that 100 in 18 hours, so it was pretty successful. I, I didn't have any issues. And then shortly after that, me and Ben Light decided to put together a course called the Brawl 300, which was um, a 300 mile course through the Utah mountains and it actually connects two iconic ultras here in, in Utah, the Bear 100 and the Wasatch 100. It took us a little bit over four days, we had a blast, I had no issues, and after the brawl was over I decided to think about going after an FKT in the similar distance range. Okay, hey everybody, welcome to the One Step Above podcast. I'm your host, Michael McKnight. We have a remarkable guest with us. She's crushing it in the ultra running world. Please join us in welcoming Courtney DeWalter. I've never run that far, so I just figured that that's what it feels like to run 300 miles or for that many days, you know? I was like, well, this is, this is the situation of this ultra you're doing, so like except that that's how it feels and we're still moving on to Denver. I basically decided to go for the Colorado Trail and went for it about three weeks later after Courtney told me to do it. This was just shortly after she had to go to the hospital and she was all about helping me, encouraging me. She told me what app to download. She told me the books to buy to study up on it. I think it's possible under a week for sure. So she made it four and a half days. She made it over 300 miles. Um, and then she had to go to the hospital because her O2 levels were down to 70. I'm very thankful that I had a crew who was paying attention. Your crew is huge. Like they know your goal. Um, and so their job is just to like have eyes on the that goal the whole time and keep you moving, but also like pay attention to some health things and safety stuff. Mike uh, came to me and he goes, hey. I'm thinking I'm going to go for the Colorado Trail FKT. Do you think you could come help me for any of it? You know, the one that Courtney, you know, was, was working on. And he just replied, yeah, I'll come for all of it. These are the weeks that work best for me. He says, 500 miles, what do you think? And I, was, I said, how do you feel? And he's like, I feel amazing. I feel great. No better time. I'm in between jobs. I'm at the peak of my training. I feel good. Would you be interested in helping me? And I said, well, of course. Of course I'm going to help you. So I recruited Ben to be my crew chief. And then three weeks later, we were on the road to Durango. <laughs> We had a ton of food. Tecano's was nice enough to help sponsor Mike's run. They provided pounds and pounds of salami, cheese, sushi. We had so much food. And then grapes and cantaloupe. For both Mike and the crew, we were planning to live like kings. Mike established a relationship with Auto Home that makes rooftop tents. They provided him a rooftop tent for his truck, which we installed as we were just getting ready to head out to Durango to start the Colorado Trail. Sweet. There oh, okay. There it is. Crewing the 500 miles across the Colorado Trail, we were gonna be in and out of some of the more remote areas. I borrowed a van from a, a good friend, threw my rooftop tent on the top of it, that gave us extra sleeping quarters and headed out to Durango. Keep the wheels on the bus going round and round. On his bus and my bus. Keep him fed, keep him hydrated, keep him moving forward. We're just trying to get him under seven days. I think he could go a lot faster, but we'll have to see how the trail conditions pan out. It looks like, you know, they got snow last week, so hopefully it melts, but I think if I waited any longer, then it would get even more snowy, so 
So hopefully this week works out. When I was 21, I just got back from serving a two-year service mission for my church. I went skiing with some friends up at a local ski resort. It was an icy day, no powder at all. So we got to this terrain park and there was this big jump in the, the park and I decided I wanted to hit the jump dead on. landed flat on my back. I instantly felt a sharp pain go through my whole body. I had surgery the next day and they put in two rods and nine screws in my spine. My parents went and got the walker and I had to use that so I could walk from my parents' house to the cemetery and back and it was two miles. And that's where my grandparents are buried. I was able to walk there and with my grandma recently passing away, I was able to go visit her grave. I ran a 10K race like exactly six weeks after my surgery. The reason I run is because I was put in a situation when I broke my back where I was worried that I would be basically immobile for the rest of my life. So I, I've always thought that if I didn't take up ultra running and went back to my old ways in high school where I would play video games and not a lot of activity that it would be a disservice to my body for how well and amazing it recovered from breaking my back. So the biggest reason is just I'm, I'm happy that I can do these races, that I can run hundreds of miles and not have any issues. And I know there's a lot of people that's not as fortunate as me and you know I want to continue to be able to do this while my body allows me to. And I just love the concept of being comfortable with the uncomfortable. There's no better way to occupy your time fully than go running for a few days for hundreds of miles. The day before Mike started in Durango, we stayed at a hotel and what we needed to do was organize the vehicles. Between my van and his truck, I think we had roughly four to five coolers. Not only Mike's food, keeping cool and fresh, it's also you got all the different crew members. He had a variety of different nutrition from his electrolytes with gnarly, his protein shakes and BCAAs, collagen. The night before, we got all the gear organized and he brings out this huge duffel bag and these are all his Solomon shoes and they're all organized. It's so big that he has it in the back of his truck. Everything was put and organized into bins in order to find it quickly. So even though this was going to be a seven day run and it was going to be over 500 miles, time was still of the essence. We wanted to get Mike in, get him back out on the trail, or get him in and get him asleep. The night before, we are pretty chill. We went out and had some barbecue, a really amazing barbecue. If you ever have Ben Light help you with something, he gives it his all. This is my last pass. So he's that Kyle Curtin's um, segment that he's kind of signed up for hotel draws. That's through tomorrow night. He sent me this Google Excel sheet where he had all the cruise spots outlined, the elevation gain and descend for me to get to those spots. He does his big climb, then he's gonna drop and then start climbing back up. From a crewing standpoint and a pacing standpoint, Mike's here to do an FKT. Something happens, you're having a bad situation. He needs to keep going and then we'll, we'll figure it out. Hey, are you gonna come out and run with That's me in a couple days? Yeah? Right. I love you more. Okay, see ya. Shots of my nasty feet. <laughs> we got to bed early. He didn't want to do a super early start. He wanted to be able to sleep in, casually get ready. He didn't want to feel pressured or anything. I mean, it's an FKT. You can start whenever you want. There's no real race start. The trail heads up north and then we go north again. Let's try it. 
strategy is to go slow. Hold back, if I feel I can go faster, just keep it dialed back, take pictures, have fun, and just try not to like go too hard and really set myself back for the next six days. I know it's the crappiest time for a pacer to pace, but preference for people to save themselves for the night as much as possible when I'll have issues with hallucinating and just finding the trail and falling asleep. So during the day I'm usually pretty good, but it's the night when the pacers really help. I've only had like one hallucination where I was flat out in a different reality and it kind of scared me. Uh, it's mostly just silly stuff. I think Mike was pretty relaxed. He was ready to get started. He was really excited about seeing the San Juans. I do a pretty good job at not fully grasping how long something's gonna take. I knew I was gonna be out there for a long time, but it didn't hit me how long it was gonna be and how hard it was gonna be. I was very nervous that there was gonna be a ton of snow and that it was gonna really slow me down. I'd say I was as calm as I could be for what was about to happen. <laughs> so I go to track. track. We get ready in the morning. We head out to the start. We already checked everything the day before and off mic goes. I have a good feeling about this. The weather looks good, everything's looking good. Even though there's a little bit of snow up high, I think, I think things are gonna work out. I think this is gonna be epic. We're gonna see him at mile 19 at Kennebec. We get up there with plenty of time. He comes in an hour ahead. It was definitely a little faster than what I thought I would do. Will you give me those Alpine shoes, please? Got it, I'll get the Alpine shoes. The reality was I didn't know how much I'd be able to run once I got up into the San Juans. How, uh, how's the snow? Well, hopefully some more will be melted by the time you get up there. Yeah. <laughs> it was hard for me. It's pretty bad. The hikers actually told us about the snow field that he was about to go into. It, it's slushy and at least you have a crew you can change your shoes a lot. Yeah. Once he heard that, he asked me to get his Solomon shoes with the built-in gator. Later in the day, you just sink right through and you're right into it. Definitely keep your gators. Yeah. Did somebody move these shoes over to my van? None. And when I went over to, to look for it, I started to go through all the different bags. I started to go through all the different bins in the back. I started to go through my van. Hey Mike, uh, where did you have your shoe bag last night? In the truck. In the truck, on the bed. I'm missing my shoes. The bag is nowhere to be found. Oh, I think I just left it in the parking lot accidentally. You expect things to go wrong when you're doing something like this big. You never expect to show up and find out that your bag of 12 shoes are missing. I don't know what the crime rate is in Durango, but it was just too easy to grab and, and take. That popped in my mind and never entered my mind again. And that's his shoes. That's all of his shoes. It doesn't matter. Well, it's nothing, but it's frustrating. I just looked at Mike, I said, don't worry about this. You just keep moving forward. We'll figure it out. And the last thing I wanted to do was to do a 500 miles in one pair of shoes. <laughs> okay, bye. Time to go. You I'm go. waiting for my, my buddy. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. And I think that this is the moment that might have derailed my nutrition. I just threw my shoes on and took off. I took like two bites of a piece of deli turkey. Good work, guys. Bye. Don't forget to smell the roses. Of course not. <laughs> you mean Mike farts? <laughs>
It was a very spectacular section, so I was able just to really enjoy the, the scene. You know, it was a blessing to get distracted a little bit. Could be a difficult time for Mike up ahead with the conditions, even though it's a beautiful day because you'll end up in mud and slush. I'm rooting for him, but I'm skeptical. So once we left Kennewick, the main goal was to obviously establish shoes. We made our way over to Durango Running Company. We'll be able to surprise him with three more pair of size 11, and then we got one pair of 11 and a half just in case for later on when his feet, if they, they start to swell. Yeah, I only had the fireman carry him for about two miles. He had a cramp. I mean, this is just one of those moments where I'm really thankful for my crew, especially Ben, I'll give him a huge shout out for this spot. What's up, Kyle? What's on the barbecue? I was really anxious and hopeful that they found my shoes. They had a table set up, and I could see three boxes of Solomon shoes sitting on the table. So when I saw that this running store had the Sense Pro in my size, I was pretty happy to have a pair of those. I have a freaking altitude headache. Do you ever get that? Yeah, for sure. Day one, we're at the Croof Point Hotel Draw. That's about 40 miles into the Colorado Trail. We're about roughly 10 hours since Mike started. Mike's about two hours ahead of his schedule and about three hours ahead of uh, FKT pace. Love you too. Doing great. Thanks. Bye, Killian. Bye. All right, you ready? Kyle was really good to have in this section. It was my first night section. Got it, Michael. I'm Kyle Curtin. I live here in Durango, Colorado. Uh, I know Mike from Ultra Running Community and Tahoe 200. I'm gonna pace him here starting about mile 45 on his Colorado Trail FKT. We're going from Hotel Pass to Molus Pass. It's about 31 miles and mostly around like 11 to 12,000 feet up. So Pretty high. Looks like we got a little weather coming in too. It was nice to have somebody with me that knew the section really well. I had no worries at all about Kyle. He kept the pace going pretty well. The last pass, which was our third crew spot for him on the first day, he notified us that he wanted to sleep here. We actually had service so we could actually watch him come in, refresh the map and saw that he wasn't moving as fast on the map as I anticipated. Kyle had to put up with a lot of complaining. <laughs> I was just really wanting to take a nap. I think the altitude was getting to me. It was a big relieving moment to get to Molus. I really just wanted to lay down, get in my sleeping bag, get in my tent. It was definitely one of my lower points. And it was only the first night. It was probably like a 45 minute nap that I was able to get in. I was doubting how far I was actually going to make it. So the bag's loaded with that stuff. And then my poles are right there. The poles are right there. He was hurting. Yeah, dude. He was feeling the elevation. He was feeling the altitude gain and loss, the ruggedness of the trail. But he was tired. The next stop we were going to hit is about 20 miles away at mile 93 on Stony Pass. From the last pass, you actually drop down into Silverton, drive through, and you come out the other side, and you start heading up this really remote canyon to Stony Pass. It took us all the way up to over 12,000 feet elevation. Yeah, I wonder why they call it Stony Pass.
this next section is pretty, is pretty. Um, massive snow-capped mountains, a magical looking area. You're just high up, you're way above tree line. It's the funniest thing because as miserable as I was, every section was just spectacular. When you reach the top is where it intersects with the Colorado Trail. When we were up at Stony Pass, Mike had a 20 mile section from Molas Pass. We were estimating him to be in around 1 p.m., four hours ahead of his sub-7 FKT. That was the pace that he was putting on. 1 p.m. came and went, and it moved closer and closer to that 4 p.m. When Mike came into Stony Pass, the look in his eye, he felt that maybe the goal that he set and the distance might be a little bit of a bigger bite. Yes! He just descended out of Molasses Pass all the way down to the river and then just climbed all the way back up to just under 13,000 feet. Felt like three hours of climbing after we dropped down there. And it was just like a long, long, brutal climb. So it was almost an eight hour section. It just took way longer than I thought it would. I couldn't breathe, I still couldn't eat. He's definitely feeling the elevation and he's getting a little tired, but that'll make him sleep good tonight. But uh, we're here rallying together, getting his wheels changed. Ooh, nice. Potato salad's going to use. Somebody offered me potato salad. And I just went to town on this potato salad. That climb definitely had a, an effect on his overall pace. He started to slip back towards the minimum of the sub seven pace. Are pretty good. Right, you guys ready? We're gonna send him on his way and uh, head on over to uh, Spring Creek Trailhead where we'll meet him up in 30 miles. We can swap pacers out in halves. So. My name is Garrett Rucker from Elko, Nevada. Mike's my coach. I'm here to, you know, help him accomplish his goals and uh, gonna pace him a bit, crew for him, and do whatever he needs me to do to help get him to the finish line. And I'll be out here for a week and see how it goes. He's looking good. He put down a lot of calories this time. Shortly after we left, I puked it all up. <laughs> Garrett, he, he's a kid that I've been coaching. He just reached out to me and was like, hey dude, I'd love to come out and pace you for about five or six days. I just knew from coaching him and seeing his progression that he was gonna be just fine. Always having fun. The San Juans are just amazing. They're so beautiful. You turn your head in any direction and it's like stunning terrain. Big mountains and you're way above tree line and so you look in any direction and you're just like it's so stunning out there colorado's so beautiful we're so lucky it met a lot of hikers on this we saw at least a couple hikers every single day in my opinion, they're the ones that are really, really tough just because they've been out there for weeks carrying all their gear, camping. It's a long trip for them and that, I feel like that takes a lot more mental toughness than going out and trying to do it in seven days. Five minutes, you got it. The second day, the altitude, puking my food up, not eating a lot of food. Just by the time we got to the top of that climb, I just needed to lay down. I was so 
exhausted <laughs> mentally, physically, emotionally. I felt worse this moment than I did the majority of the rest of the trail. <laughs> I grew up super overweight. I overate quite a bit. I had a bad addiction to food, just a bunch of processed junk. I drank a lot of soda. I was not into physical activity at all. Started to gain weight. Along with all that, I started to get made fun of quite a bit. I got called fatty quite a bit, making comments like that that made me kind of self-conscious about my eating habits. So there's just a point where, um, I just got sick of it all and it was in between my freshman and my sophomore year I decided I wanted to lose weight. I ran a mile a day and then this is probably the hardest thing I've ever done but I would only eat the portion size like recommended sizes on all of the like a box of cereal I'd only have a cup of cereal for breakfast and whatever the recommended serving size was I, that's all I would eat for about half a year. The three and a half months of summer break, I, I lost about 40 pounds. You know, got to school and the fatty comments were gone, which was great. One thing about my dad is he loves his classic cars. So it's kind of our project. So these pictures kind of show the beginning, the middle, and the end. And my dad always loves to joke that as the car transition, I also transitioned because I used to be overweight. So this is my really heavier stage. This was kind of the same, but I lost a little bit of weight. And then towards the end, when the car is complete, that's when I was like kind of at the peak of my weight loss. So these pictures are fun to look at because it's just, it brings back a lot of memories. It's not that perfect. Is that bad news? Laying down on that trail felt so comfortable. <laughs> This nap did a lot of wonders for me. <laughs> yeah, I have quite a bit of doubts going through my head right now. I'm not used to being up at that altitude for that long. The first three days just really wore me out. I just want to sleep in my bed. most important thing is to keep reassuring him that the FKT is completely obtainable and that he is making good time and just to keep moving forward. Don't focus on the whole 500 miles, just focus on the next checkpoint. Spring Creek became night two. Shortly after getting there, Mike comes pulling in and he was in at 126 miles. He slept for a little bit and got back up and pulled right back out and headed back out on the trail before even the sun came up. We are on our way to uh, Eddysville. We had about a four hour drive. Mike's roughly 51 hours in and he's almost to mile 150. Um, he's doing well, he's picking it back up. He got, he's gotten through the San Juans and uh, he's making his way through like the Continental Divide area. From what I saw last night when he took off, he was, I think he was looking a lot better. He's, I think he slept okay. He's, you know, okay for Mike, and uh, he's been eating a lot better, and he says his altitude headache has kind of gone away, so I think his body's just kind of getting dialed into the ultra mode.
Dax was the perfect pacer for this section. I met Dax just over a year ago. I met him at the Bigfoot 200 in 2019. Just became pretty good friends after that. He's just one of the funniest guys that you'll ever meet. If you film from the right angle, it might look really funny. The back of the mud flap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to have Dax in this section and distract me and crack jokes with me really, really helped me out. So it's gnarly, what's that? Gnarly Martin. It seemed like his spirits were up from what they were at Stony Pass. That's what I was hoping for. That's what I felt that we could expect. You go through your lows, you go through your highs, and you know, it all works out. They had a really good system. Like I'd just come in, sit down, someone would take my shoes off. Only thing I really had to answer was just what I wanted in my water bottles and what I wanted in my pack, and then they took care of it all. Everything seemed to have the stars aligned to where I could actually feel comfortable enough to actually get out on the trail and leave, leave the crew, but get out and spend some time with Mike, which was just so much fun. When I found out Ben was going to pace me, I was excited because, you know, me and Ben run a lot together, so he knows me really well. He knows how to talk me out of low spots. All right, so we just came out of Eddiesville. We are on our way to the next crew point, which will be Highway 114. After this night, it was only one more night till I got to see Sarah and Killian, so that kind of kept me going. I'm here to support Mike in any way that I can. Decided to come help him out. He put a, a call out for some, some crew help, and I wrote him back, and I'm like, yeah, I'd love to help. I'm hoping to run with him a little bit. My segment's coming up tonight, probably starting around 10 p.m. So I'll run through the night. So I'm gonna try to get some shut eye. Well, Mr. McKnight, what do you want to tell all those that are watching your dot work its way across Colorado? I'm sorry it's moving so slow. <laughs> so slow, but he's on track for the fastest known time. When I came in at Highway 114, the decision was to, to keep moving. I knew what Mike needed. The most important thing is to get Mike restocked, get the food that he needs, and then get him out the door. 3.56 a.m. I think it's just right across the road. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, see cool. you guys. All right, get him. Okay. Once he's out the door, I can start attending to my needs. From a crewing aspect, it got a lot easier because most of the crew points were accessible from asphalt. This is obviously Mike's. So we need to get this into Mike's. So it's Thursday afternoon. Uh, we are at US Highway 50. That's going to be mile 230. We're expecting Mike any minute right now. He had a really rough night last night, but he took a short nap. We'll see how he's doing after a 30 mile stretch on his own. This spot was really nice because I knew it was the last spot that I'd be hitting before I'd see Sarah and Killian. I knew that um, I'd be seeing them that night, so that was keeping me going. So I was just so tired that I didn't want to try to eat any foods. I had like two gels. Okay, I want, I want you just to sit here for a second and just, you need to get some nutrition in you, okay? You just need to keep eating real food. I think if anybody has the capability to go out and crack this off in the time that he is hoping to do it, it is probably Mike. I'm Kerry Ward from Vancouver, Canada. Came down to support Mike on this effort as part of a, let's call it a month and a half adventure. Very much looking forward to getting out on the trail and running 
out here. Slight worries just about the altitude, which is considerable, and just being able to maintain pace, but hopefully he'll have, you know, 100 miles in his legs before I get into him. I remember I had to do a lot of single leg squats, I did air squats, I did stretches. I was doing a lot of stuff to try and combat the pain that I was starting to feel in my knee. I was just really trying to stay on top of it, hoping that if I did these kind of things that it wouldn't get any worse. I think the wall sits and the, all the mobility exercises that I did in this section helped keep the knee at bay. I grew up in a small town called Cornish, Utah. It's the furthest north town in Utah you can get. The Idaho border is a mile from my house. There's about 200 people at any given time who live there. There's a lot of families that grow up on dairy farms out there, which was my case. I grew up milking cows, feeding calves, moving pipe, hauling hay, cutting hay. It's like a three or four generation dairy farm. We'd go to bed at 9, 9.30 and wake up at 2 o'clock to milk the cows. Yeah, this is where all the magic happened. We, we had cows come in on both sides. And then we'd take these machines down and, and stick them up on the udders and it would suck all the milk out. Every summer growing up, I was getting about four hours of sleep every night. Just came home exhausted, fell asleep, and woke up at 2 again the next day. It's just a really hard lifestyle but I also contribute that lifestyle to being able to run a lot off of little sleep just because I grew up functioning off of little sleep. You'd be surprised how comfortable the ground is when you're that tired. That 500 mile distance I think is just really unique in finding the line between how little you can sleep and then how quickly you can still move. It's only two to five minutes, but it feels like a long time. And then that voice comes and brings me back to reality. All right, buddy, let's do this. <clears throat> just the general feeling I had every single time I woke up from a nap was just complete dread that I was still in the middle of this. I've never longed for my bed and covers and not having to wake up more than I did throughout this trip. I think you better take a banana break. Hmm. We got the biggest thing that kept me going is I just kept telling myself that I was going to get to see Sarah and Killian. It's always super exciting to see Mike come in after not seeing him. It was a relief to see him come in, see him strong and in pretty good spirits too. I missed you. It was just really, really relieving to see them at this next section. Even though I knew I'd only see them for a little bit, it was just helpful to know that I'd be seeing them at every crew spot after that. In this whole Colorado trail experience, I owed a Courtney, really, totally surprised me on the morning of day five that her husband, Kevin, showed up just to say hi and cheer me on. He was excited to, to see you and to um, see your whole crew. He swung by, saw how Mike was doing, and wanted to offer his encouragement. It sounded maybe more like just a little cyanotic. Like, sciatic? Yeah, sciatic. Kind of, you know. A guy named Kevin showed up to pace me. He grew up in the area that we ran, so he knew the trail really well. So he, it was really awesome to have him with me. He's a really, really good guy. Okay, almost ready. Good. Mike was in a lot better moods during the day. Once we were able to get into these easier accessible sections, we were able to see him more often. And so he didn't have to go so long without a substantial meal or changing his socks. Hey. <laughs> it was actually, you know, I'll see you guys. You guys. You guys. Okay. Yeah. The next section was a good, healthy section with a big climb. It was going to take him a good amount of time. So we had time to go into Leadville, evaluate our supplies, restock our coolers grab more personal grocery items that we might need for ourselves, gas up. 
He's a little behind on his sub seven gold pace. The next stop in about the next uh, three hours, he'll be at 300 miles and about 175, 85 to go. The next trailhead was just down the road, you know, 10 miles right on the side of the road. This is Clear Creek Trailhead. There was less stress about getting there and we were able to just kind of decompress just a little bit for that temporary period of time. When he got there, everybody kind of clicked into helping mode and after a couple times I had it down, I felt like a, like a cocktail <laughs> mixer. There was like eight things going into that protein shake. <laughs> Definitely after a couple stops, I felt like, I was like, okay, he's changing his socks at every stop. He's switching up his shoes, get the socks and shoes and the protein mixed up and supply his sparkling water. You know, every, every day and night was just getting a little bit closer to the finish. So I was in pretty good spirits at this point. The end starting to get a little bit in sight because it's day five. I knew that if I was able to maintain the pace that I basically only had a 200 mile race left, you know, a couple more days. Good luck. I'll see ya. Bye. He's someone I coach. He's doing his first 100 miler tonight. This is where I really started to get loopy. Starting to get in this like foggy, hazy state. The sleep deprivation is starting to compound. There was a moment where crew met halfway through. The minute he saw us and pulled in, he instantly wanted to sleep. I was just so, so wrecked. Only a couple hours of sleep and it's been five nights. I really, really, really wanted to take a nap. We had not planned to even be there, let alone have him sleep there. And my crew was just telling me, no, like you can't take a nap right now, you gotta keep going. If he kept moving, we'd give him a bigger sleep time at Mount Massive. I just kept telling her like, I need to take a nap, I need to take a nap. I definitely feel bad sometimes inside when I'm pushing him to leave. I know that he really wants to stay and I definitely would love for him to stay a little bit longer. That was about 9 p.m. I knew that if he slept then, it'd be a super long night. And if we just finished that section, finished it sort of middle of the night, then he'd be able to have a few hours. The day would break, it would be a fresh thing. So that's when things started to break down. Some of the hallucinations started to happen. He would walk along and all of a sudden he would stop and he'd look. I would say, what do you see, Mike? And he said, I see monkeys riding a four-wheeler. That's not real, is it? <laughs> no, it's not real at all. Wandering all over the trail, on the trail, off the trail. I couldn't walk in a straight line. I had to take multiple trail naps. This was the lowest part of the whole FKT attempt. He has paid the price requisite to actually see hallucinations like that. We are looking to hit another 10 miles in the next few hours and get him asleep. The next spot, I just told my crew, I don't care what you guys say, I need to take a nap. And so we got to that next spot, I took a nap, I was able to pass out. And that next section, after I finally got my nap, I crushed it. Set the, set the fastest time across the Colorado Trail. Well, I don't want to interrupt that. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. You all have a good day. You too. Getting past that night, that was just getting over the hill and my spirits were a little bit higher and I was able to find a gear that I hadn't been able to find for the whole thing. I have a good, good buddy named Josh Stevens. He showed up and ran 40 miles with me. I was really looking forward to running with him.
Each of the stops got longer and longer. They got longer because from a mental push standpoint, it's hard to turn and burn when you're gone that far. Doing good, buddy. Don't fall asleep. Why? Because you need to either be doing that or eating. I don't think there's anything wrong with a little bit <laughs> here. <laughs> I know it doesn't sound like a little bump and grind. Mike, do you want any of these primal kitchen How about bars? This? Put some food in and take two or three long. bites. A little bump and sleep. And sleep, and then two or three bites and sleep. Like that. Mike, what flavor? So this horse walks into a bar, Mike. The bartender says, hey, why the long face? Killing, oh we go. <laughs> just killing, he's absolutely he's, dead. We have one pack of electrolyte. Okay. And I was just gonna send two with him. Okay. That way he's trickling in some calories that way too. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. I had my first Duke's original recipe smoke. Not only is he physically tired, but he's mentally tired. He's mentally tired from pushing, mentally tired from hanging that carrot out in front of him and driving himself forward. He can actually decompress here and it's so important for him to decompress, to reset, to, to forget about the section that he went through. It's over, it's done with, no more. Now I got a new section, you know, that close the book on the last section and, and open a new chapter. Take it on from a mindset that it is a new adventure. This one down here. All right, see Bye. ya. He was super, super excited to see his friend Josh. And so that was a big boost in his morale. He had asked if I'd come out and help him on uh, this little project. So it's been, uh, been a real treat to be out here today. And we've got 13 in change in and about another 25 to go. I think Ben Cherry picks the easy stuff for me. Let's get you wrapped up. Let's close. Oh. He's right behind you. We can start seeing his lights. All right, good. Uh, where can I sit down? Yep. Uh, where, where can I sit down? Oh. He was hurting a little bit. I think he said it was his biggest run all year by a long shot. So the fact that he came out and hurt that much and did all that for me just to give me company for 40 miles is really awesome. That last segment was pretty, was pretty stout. Uh, it was nice coming out of Tennessee Pass, like the next six miles were pretty smooth. Now yeah, got going and uh, it's a really, uh, it's a really good challenging climb up to Kokomo. Uh, and then you're up over 12,000 feet again and still have another 14 miles to go to get down here. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, it was, a, it was definitely an attention getter. We ended up, I think, going about 40 miles together today, so. Uh, yeah, he's he's amazing, and I, I have to say I'm quite happy to be here with blankets wrapped around me now. That last eight miles felt like a exceedingly long eight miles. Okay. Nice. Okay. Pulled. Okay. Did you have a protein? Oh shoot, I didn't mix one up. By this point, I had three hours of total sleep throughout the whole five nights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm all I'm ready. Sleeping. You're sleeping. Yeah. Mike was, you know, he's tired. When the lights go out, it puts that fog on the mind. We can go and we can sleep at the next one too. We can do both. Do like 50-50 or um, I'm just, I'm just so you don't fall backwards. It's almost midnight. It's like 15 minutes to midnight. So let's shoot for um, 2, 2 a.m. Alarm. Alarm. Uh, he's sleeping till 2 and then, um, he, we're gonna get up and, and uh, get ready and get, get out of here. He keeps making the statement, I don't know how I'm gonna keep going. I don't know how I'm going to uh, get through this. Uh, my legs are so tired, I'm so tired. And we just, uh, I'm just trying to get him to focus in on just one segment at a time. Okay, let's get out of here. <clears throat> Good job, baby. <laughs> See you on the other side yeah. of the mountain. Yep. <laughs>
<laughs> Hopefully that's what you meant. That's what I meant. Ben paced me on this next section and it was just like a really steep climb up followed by a really steep climb down. We just went over about a 3,000 foot climb last night. Just hammering it hard, coming down. We are about to hit mile roughly 375, 380. He has just about 100 miles remaining. He has one little range to go through until he starts to make the descent down into Denver. I promised him 30 minutes if he didn't take a trail map. You hit that 100 mile left and you start getting under that, that's a good I hope my hate in the barn starts waking him up. Yeah. Just start making your way down. I'm going to take your bag and your uh, shoes over. Yes. <laughs> This donut is just looking so good. It, it put a smile on his face. Thank you. This is a corner that we're turning with Mike, the low carb runner. It was so delicious. Eating the good stuff. Oh yeah. Yep. You're gonna like send us to the store to buy you a whole bunch of food. I didn't even realize how much I like donuts. The famous donut is what he accuses the uh, inflammation in his knee this next section. He blames it on the gluten in the donut. It was a few hours after having that friggin' donut that my quad gave out and really didn't get any better the rest of the way. It was also probably that I have ran 400 miles at this point. <laughs> We're gonna pass the 400 mark on this run. Yeah. So I think he'll have about 80 miles left by the time when we get to Kenosha Pass. They just happened to be in the area while I was passing through, so Nora met up and did a good section with me, starting in Breckenridge. We've got a long, fun day ahead of us. Yep. You're not going to awesome. run. <laughs> run. Keep them moving, keep them positive, you know? Keep it steady. You know? We got history to make, so. Kill you. Bye. See ya, Dad. You. See ya. Kill you. Give Daddy a hug. I love you. Love you. Have a good day. Nora was great to have. She was a great runner, really talkative, and thought it was really cool that while she was out on this vacation slash house hunting type trip that she would take a full day to come running with me. I was just really hoping that they were gonna be at mile 15 into this section instead of mile 30 because I wanted to muscle blast my hips. I wanted to do some self-care really bad and fortunately the crew was there and I was able to do some self-care, self-maintenance uh, 15 miles earlier than what we had planned before we went into this. Yes. He 
he came in in really good spirits. He really enjoyed the conversation he had with Nora. Nora was a fantastic pacer. Nora and I was able to move somewhat at a good pace with night six, quad hurting, super tired. Yeah, he had a knee issue where his quad was getting really, really sore. And so uh, we took his buff and wrapped it around the top of his knee um, to alleviate some pressure. See, if it's the donut that jacked my knee up. I told you he was gonna play with the donut. Me. I was like, we're gonna <laughs> He's not moving like somebody who has run over 400 miles. I'll tell you that. He's doing great. <laughs> you ready, Greg? Uh, I think so. <laughs> yes, you are. Greg was just like a super happy and good-spirited person. I had no idea who he was, didn't know what to expect. I just remember that he reached out to, I think, Ben on Instagram and told Ben he wanted to come and pace me. My name is Greg. I'm originally from upstate New York, but I live in Indian Hills outside of Denver now. And uh, I'm out here to help pace Mike for uh, the next 13 or so miles um, Colorado Trail, closing in on the end here. I think he's got about 70 left, so uh, just trying to keep him entertained, keep some positivity going. He's doing really good at keeping the conversation going. Um, talked about his trail running journey. So it was just like a good conversation, getting to know each other. I was just going into a cold, dark night and I wanted to sleep, so I started to do the death walk again. He did not want to sleep tonight. The hay is in the barn. He wants to be finished before uh, too late tomorrow. It's been a, it's been a wild, fun ride. I, I kind of like being on the uh, running side, I'd have to say. This was a miserable to drive out to. Awful. It was like driving on a cobblestone road. It beat the tar out of my mounts. Uh, I think there's some rattles in that van still to this day from, from that section getting back there. During this section here at uh, Long Gulch, the trailhead that is indicated on the map is technically about two or 300 yards away from the actual trail. I wrote a sign. Yeah, it'll be fine. He'll see it. Put Mike's name on it, took the Kagala light, threw it into flash mode that it would catch his attention because middle of the night, they're tired, they're cold, they're just going to be looking three feet ahead of them and they're gonna blow right through. I had to clear a trail from the trail down to where we could, where we parked. You better not get lost. By the time I made that trail, I get down here, I'm like, he's gonna be here anyways. I could've just sat there on the trail and waited for him. <laughs> so he'll wake me up? Yeah. He's doing great. Um, He's down on himself about it because he's not running the way he did 400 miles ago. Big surprise. <laughs> but he's getting a, a little bit uh, just sleepy, you know, like just mentally he's just clouding out on the uphills. And then on the downhills, he seems to get in a flow, even though the knee seems to be bugging him. He seems to be able to get, like, make up some good time. Is Car uh, Carrie getting ready? Getting yeah, ready. It was the sixth night. I knew that everything went well, I'd be finishing in about 24 hours. Yeah. With his knee and slowing him down, we knew that his seven-day goal was starting to slip away. We continuously encouraged him not to focus on that, but just to focus on getting it done. Hey, really hurts so much. I'm gonna start walking, Carrie. I'm with you. <coughs> See you, things, guys. Okay. Have a good one, Tom. Take care, gentlemen. Bye, sweetie. Oh. <coughs> Mike's got the music going now. You know it's serious. Hopefully that'll bring us into morning and daylight. It's well below zero still. But as long as we're moving, it's warm enough. Mike is taking his bottles out because he is about to have 
a five minute dirt nap on the trail. He's just walking zombie in terms of falling asleep. Now he's looking for a good spot. That looks <laughs> fantastic. Look at that bed. Snow White couldn't have asked for anything better. I'm giving you five minutes, dude. Enjoy. That's your five minutes, man. Yeah. Let's do it. Uh. Good stuff, man. Oh. That's what I'm talking about. He's on the trail. He's moving. Take a right. It's like having my real life personal zombie I get to follow through the woods. I'm Chris Mealy. I live in Denver. Uh, Mike's my coach. He's been my coach since November. Um, super stoked to be out here. It's pretty crazy that he's here already, but uh, hopefully I can keep up. <laughs> Talked on the phone a bunch, email him every week, but uh, never met him in person yet. Should be pretty interesting to meet him now. He had no idea who I was. And I just kind of stared at him. He was still kind of coming back too. I've <laughs> <laughs> never met in person. <laughs> I'm delirious too, so I'm well, yeah. sorry. <laughs> He's a really cool kid. <laughs> We're just coming upon his sub seven marker goal where he wanted to be finished. 40 miles is so, so close. The FKT's in the bag as long as he can push forward, but that knee just, it's not how you want to finish any race. You're almost down now. Is it going to be over today? Yeah, we, no, no, you're at your pace, what you're doing right now, if you can just maintain, we're going to be done before dark. You're going to be done in less than 12 hours. Did I have to walk 40 miles? Did you walk that whole thing? It was just, it was a really hard spot. I was worried that I'd be walking all the way to the finish. So what do you recommend? Just blasting my muscle and hope it gets better? If you can do what you're doing right now, it's still going to be over before the lights go out. You're going to be in a bed tonight. And that's all That's all you have to keep saying to yourself. I'm going to be in my bed and I'm going to have the FKT by almost 24 hours. You're not doing any damage. Do you see me? I'm fine. I'm running again. Do you see how bad I was coming out of that because it was all locked up? It's just all locked up. It's Your muscles said, I'm done. So you might as well just start sprinting and get it over with. No. I tried that. <laughs> just, I tried that. I can't even imagine that at the end of the brawl. Like, <laughs> but you're, you're, you're right there with where, where I was. So theoretically, if I sprinted and just dealt with it, I couldn't, I'm not going to hurt myself anymore. I'm not going to say that one. We were joking about sprinting. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's fine. And I had this idea in my head if I like maybe started sprinting, maybe I could trick my quad into thinking that I was okay. One of the things that you were saying at the very beginning of day seven as you were closing in on Waterton Canyon. Well, I imagine that a lot of it would be tears. Yeah. <laughs> well, like happy and sad. <laughs> oh, I think, oh my gosh. Oh, oh, whoa. Very high maintenance. Not at all. Oh. Hey, if you're going to go for the supported record, you go for the supported hey, record. That's right? right. <laughs> take, take all the support you can get. <laughs> Mike really started to pick up in spirits. 4.34 today is 24 hours before it. So 4.34 tomorrow is the FKT on Tuesday. PM. PM. 20 plus elk. 
it was the seventh morning, so I knew that, that I'd be finishing some light relatively soon. It's 8.50, which means in five minutes, it'll be one week effort. <laughs> and then by week, I mean the actual time period, not week like is in strength. <laughs> it's pretty, it's a pretty insane record so far. <laughs> Where are we going? This way. Oh. Yeah, go down nice. the road. We get to see okay. where we drove up. You see what the Prius is? So, we can do more. Get John, race him. Race him, John. Yeah, then you will pull some. Go! Wait, wait, where is it? This road? Just yeah. follow yeah, the road. Just follow the road. Down this road, yeah. All right, let's go. <laughs> On your marks, get set, go! Go! He's sliding away. Hey. <laughs> if you keep doing that, I can't calculate when you're coming in. <laughs> crewing that I would have to say is when the runner leaves you pack your stuff up you get to the next location before you ever sleep I had these small 45 minute interval naps I think I was if I was lucky I got two a day my day consisted of driving crewing sometimes running I'm ready for this to be over with <laughs> Golden Harper, the founder of Ultra, showed up and ran to the next crew spot with us. It was just really fun to catch up with Golden. Super awesome seeing how strong he was even towards the very end, just mentally persevering through all the physical pain. It's like really cool to see. I grew up super unathletic. I've always had a physical hatred uh, towards exercise. All three seasons I tried football, I rode the bench, never played. Track, I came in, lasted second to last at every single track meet. Didn't see any kind of success with it. The concept of trail running is just really remarkable and for me it's all about gratitude because I grew up overweight, super inactive, didn't even know that this kind of thing existed. My friends tried getting me into mountain biking and I remember I didn't even make it a mile into a bike ride with them once and I convinced them all to stop and go to a buffet with me. I gotta set like some pretty big limits on myself with food or else I have no control over it. I'm just the type of person where I do things in extremes. I don't just run a few miles a day to stay in shape. I have this weird desire where I have to go run multiple miles for hours a day or else I don't feel as satisfied. As someone who loves him as much as I do, I was very happy. Happy for Mike, happy to see the end. Even though it's his accomplishment, it feels kind of like my accomplishment. Stones we carry, clothes we lived in, all the tales we will tell our children. It's an emotional roller coaster as the wife 
of somebody that does these things. I constantly worry about him and I get excited with him. I feel pain with him when he comes in feeling low and it's exhausting, but it's definitely very rewarding. So I'm going to run the last section with him, but he doesn't know. Hopefully that'll be exciting for him. What's the surprise? That's a good one, yeah. What do I find out? Nice job, I'm looking away. One more? Okay. Wait, you're not finishing with me? Uh, he, yeah, that's a surprise. He's, he can't go with you. Because <laughs> you're not by yourself. That's a surprise? Yeah. You're, you gotta, you gotta do this alone, man. Is that seriously the surprise? This is your, this is your challenge. I'm having too much fun with this. <laughs> Are you running with me or not? <laughs> He's I, a driver. <laughs> are you running with me? Are you running with me? I am running with you. Really? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Say it super good, okay? Say it super good. Come meet us, okay? Yeah, I was pretty nervous because <laughs> I'd only ever run a half marathon and the next section was well, like 16 miles. Surprising me that she was going to get a run with me was completely awesome. Just never expected that she was going to finish with me, and I'm really happy that she was able to. It was fun to do part of it with her. We're here at Waterton Canyon. Uh, this is the pretty much the finish line. This is the Denver part of the uh, Colorado Trail. <laughs> Gonna start walking up to meet him along the way and kind of guide him in to the finish line. If he finishes between nine and 10, he'll be looking at taking off roughly 19 or 18 hours off of the FKT time of the Colorado Trail, setting a new record for the Collegiate East from west to eastbound. I'm amazed how he just kept moving forward, pretty much no matter what. It's a ridiculous thing to be out for seven days on almost no sleep, relentlessly pushing forward on a trail. What, what oh, this doing? is a huge deal. Yeah, people try this every year and fail miserably or they get really close and have to call it i mean mostly just injury i think and just the mental side of being up for a week or longer running every day i mean it's not an easy thing to do so to see uh, mike push his personal farthest distance and push his personal limits it's it's pretty incredible to, to watch on such a amazing trail I've been spending a lot of time recently thinking about the word broken and the meaning behind that word. I spent a good portion of my early years feeling sad and out of place and the reality is I felt broken. I felt like there was something wrong with me. The constant fat jokes, the constant being made fun of, not feeling like I fit in because I couldn't perform athletically, it, it really messed me up mentally. Further, I physically broke my back and I physically was broken. This 
FKT means a lot to me. I, I never ever imagined that I'd be into a point in my life where I could go after records and not only go after records, but achieve records. And so being able to go from broken to breaking the Colorado Trail, FKT is, is very meaningful for me. It's something that I'm truly grateful for and you know, it gives me a lot of hope and I, I'm looking forward to going after more FKTs in the future. Congratulations, that was amazing. It was so fun to follow along on, on your adventure of it and I hope that your recovery goes well. I'm a truck driver, turn up a bitch, oh yeah.